um, a couple of years later, uh, y'all sat for a second portrait. This is the portrait that's at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, James Alexander Simpson painted this portrait when he was 18 years old. It depicts a, a kind of an older Yarrow. Um, oh, when Yarrow died in 1823, Peel wrote his obituary, which is rare for mm -hmm. an African American to have um, an obituary appear in the newspaper. In the obituary, Peel noted that um, Yarrow was known to be an industrious, moral, and honest man, um, that he was never known to eat or, or drink alcohol. But more importantly for archaeologists is that he was buried in the garden where he was known to pray. Mm -hmm. So we had the property um, and we began to do um, archaeological investigations. We tried everything we could and we found no definitive proof of Yarrow's occupation of the site um, within the archaeological record. The lot is very small. It's 150 by 35 feet. It has a large in-ground pool smack dab in the middle of it. So what we believe happened, it slopes, historically it looks, slopes down and to the east. So we believe when they uh, dug the pool, they put that dirt on the back half to level it out. So it would have obscured anything that was there. Mm -hmm. um, but that really wasn't um, important to me. I was more interested in the story. I had never heard of black Muslims before Yarrow. Um, so I began my research. And then on August 15, 2015, we held a funeral prayer at the site. And as I noticed people, or African American Muslims there, nobody really, I mean, there are a few questions about, you know, what, was, what did we find? But I thought it was more interesting that African American Muslims wanted, just were just happy to know that their story was being told. I mean, this is the first time an archaeologist or an archaeological team had ever done um, archaeology on an enslaved Muslim site before in our field, um, and it's still the only site that we know of, so it's very important to us. And so I began my research. Um, so now that I have it up, so this was the day of the funeral prayer. This is Yarrow, this is the Peel portrait, this is the Simpson portrait. Um, this is our archaeological team, so Sade Reed, Ruth Tricoli, who's a city archaeologist for D.C., me and Charlie Lee Decker, and of course, Muhammad is sweating in the background. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so this is some of the site that we worked on. Um, we recovered about 17,000 artifacts, the oldest artifact that we believe we have is a bead that was made in the 17th century. It either has a green heart or a red heart, and the outside is flipped. Um, so like a prayer bead, you think, or, or a so. But it was only one. It wasn't mm -hmm. in the sealed context. Um, but Amir and I talked about it afterwards, and we think it might be. Um, so here is. Where's that held at right now? What? The bead. Uh, it's at the DC Historic Preservation Office. So these are some of the artifacts. Um, most of the artifacts date to the 1850s house that stood on the property. Um, there were three dog burials, a couple of dozen ceramic beads, a portion of a doll's face. Um, this top is a medicine bottle, um, a couple of combs, little artifacts. I've processed them all, I've seen them all, um, but we haven't done um, any more analysis on them as of yet because I've been working on my book. You say comb? Yeah, like a comb. What, what kind of comb? Like a comb you brush your hair with or comb your hair with. Anything so. significant about them? What they was made out of? No, it was a plastic. So um, more modern day. Um, yeah, most of the artifacts. I like combs he made of you. No, even the ceramics um, that you can see here, they date to about this time period, but to date a ceramic takes a lot of time and effort. You don't get like an exact year. You get a date range that might be 100 years. So it's hard to pinpoint when he would have used that or if he actually used it himself. Um, so then where do you go? Um, I wanted to know, you know, who were the first Muslims, 
why hadn't we heard about them before, um, things like that. So I wrote my dissertation. Um, it's called How Religion Preserved the Man, the Exploring the History and Legacy of African Islam through the Yarmouk Archaeology Project. It is available online um, from the University of Florida, but most of that information will come out in my book. Um, so these are some new definitions that I wanted to kind of present to you as we work through the next portion of this. So the first one is racism. So most people think racist are just those bad people um, who dislike you, but actually racism is a far-reaching system that emerges once a racial group's collective prejudice is supported by the legal system and through institutional control. It functions independently from the intersections or self-images of individual actors. Um, white privilege is the next term. It is described as this uh, invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, guidebooks, codes, passports, visas, clothes, compasses, emergency gear, and blank checks that white people can count on cashing in each day. The next term is white supremacy, which is a socio-political economic system of domination that is based on racial categories that benefit those um, who are perceived as white. Um, I can share this PowerPoint later. If you click through it, I'll go back. How do you spell his name again? Yaro? Yeah. Y-A-R-R-O-W-M-A-M-O-D-T. Okay. M-A-Y-O? M-A-M-O-U-T. Okay. So, um, the earliest Muslims were here before Columbus. There's research that said um, he was, they were here at least five centuries before Columbus. They came as African explorers or escaping the Spanish Inquisition. There are geographical counts, um, diaries, artifacts that point to this. We know that Columbus himself was uh, guided by two Muslim brothers, the Bazan brothers, um, and that he wrote that he saw a mosque, but he also noticed African Muslims in Cuba, Panama, Jamaica, and along the coast between Mexico and Brazil. Good. This is documented? So the very first Muslim, uh, the first documented Muslim in the U.S. was Esteban. He came here in 1527 with the Panfilo de Navarra's expedition. Um, he is credited with discovering the Zuni Indians in the America. It's right back there. Oh, what? The exhibit. Oh, yeah. Um, in the American Southwest. Um, the interesting part of his story is that he was killed. Um, they thought he was an envoy of war. But the um, first true wave of Muslims in the U.S. were enslaved African men, women, and children. 10 to 40 percent of the enslaved population is Muslim. So between 600,000 and 1.2 million people. Next. Um, they are considered the good. You have a question? I'm astonished. Not necessarily a question. I'm not interrupting. <laughs> okay. I'm just astonished. Go, go free. Um, so they were considered the good slaves. They were very literate. Like Muhammad said, most of them knew several languages. They were well traveled. Um, most of them were elite members of society. Enslaved African Muslims in the U.S. practiced intellectual resistance. So they kept their names. They um, they prayed, things like that. However, in Brazil, they are known for being more violent. Mm -hmm. So in um, Bahia, Brazil, in 15 something, I think. 35. Yeah. 1835. 1835. They led an uprising. They also received preferential treatment. They were considered um, to be more attractive since they looked Turkish, and so they were put in positions of power over um, other enslaved people. But they were also um, selected because of their skills in rice cultivation. Thanks. So, does that mean, that's like basically requiring that they were pretty much in the house under the the main master. Sometimes, not always. Not always. No. So they were like prominent figures that held prominent positions. Some of them, but then you have um, some slave owners who wanted to beat 
Islam out of them. And so they specifically targeted them for that. But we know from archaeological records that some slave owners in the South did honor the fact that they didn't um, eat pork, and so they would have given them more provisions of beef or chicken. That's, that's what, when you said that figure of how many, you know, 20 to 40 percent of the population, enslaved population that came to America, and, you know, just being um, just knowledgeable of the slave era and the tactics that they used to try to break break the slaves and mm -hmm. just and uh, dissociate them from their religion and from their cultural practices, you know, uh, that's, that's where that figure was like, wow, so they must have, you know, broke them to the point where they... A lot of them forgot or put down their religious beliefs and values, or just masked it or undercovered it for their, for their, you know, white and slave. In a know, way, for, their, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, the Islam that enslaved Africans brought with them was kind of defunct by 1850. Mm -hmm. um, but then you see a rise of it, um, and like a, in the 1920s. So like Muhammad said, um, black nationalism and pan-Africanism <coughs> started to arise again in the late 19th century. So African Americans were looking for a way to get an identity. So after Reconstruction had failed, they wanted to know, so who are we, who are we what do we do? So um, they migrated. Mm -hmm. So uh, between like 1917, thousand or millions of African Americans migrated to northern urban centers hoping to escape um, the racial oppression they had in the South to look for new opportunities. Unfortunately, the racism in the South was just different in degree, not kind. So um, they were segregated into these ghettos like Harlem. Mm -hmm. But then in Harlem, you see the Harlem Renaissance. So you get um, organizations like the NAACP, the National Urban League, who are appealing to the sensibilities of middle class blacks. Mm. But nobody was really attracting the mass of lower class blacks. Right. But then you have Marcus Garvey come in. Mm -hmm. And so Marcus Garvey was never, he never converted to Islam, but he was mentored by Deuce Muhammad Ali. And so because of his mentorship, his slogans like the One Unity, mm -hmm. that came from um, Deuce Muhammad. And his movement too, was that part of it, like trying to get people back to Africa? Was yeah, he was a black nationalist. Okay. Um, and then trying to think of what else is on that slide. Um, but then you have like the, the more science temple, and that was like the first kind of early Muslim movement that came up. Mm. Yeah. Feel free to take a peek at the slide. You know, you there, you know. <laughs> no, I'm good. I remember it by heart most of the time. Oh, that's a I, um, you said You said how many people um, did they came over? 600,000 to 1.2 million. And, and where? Like, where is this number, you know, like, where, how, where, where is this number coming from? Um, early estimates. From who? Scholars in the field. Specifically? I don't remember off the top of my head. I can get you that information. Alan Austin, Michael Gomez, Sylvian Juf, T-I-O-U-F. Mm -hmm. Also, another good book called um, <clears throat> the Slave Religion uh, by David Blassingame, B-L-A-S-S-I-N-G-A-M-E. Talks about life, B-L-A-S-S-I-N-G-A-M-E, Blassingame. I can send you some of this stuff. Uh, I think it's Slave Religion. Basically, the percentage is coming off of anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the population of the enslaved people that was brought there. The estimate was the Muslim, that's where the numbers come from. When it, you said it was what's happening? Is that they take a percentage from anywhere from 20 percent to 40 percent. <coughs> of what? Of Africans that were brought here, people that were enslaved and brought here. 20 to 40 percent of them was of the Islamic faith. So that's where they get that number from, from non Africans that were brought into the slave trade. 20 to 40 percent of them were people that were living in the Muslim or Islamic faith. It, it's important to highlight, too, I'm trying to get you a context. Mm -hmm. 
5% of the enslaved population, or uh, of enslaved Africans who left West Africa from various points in what we know modern day 54 nation African states, 5% came to what we know North America. The rest went to the Caribbean, the Caribbean, West Indies, and South America, right? 5%. The rest are dispersed out. Brazil is the largest population of Africans outside of the continent. Mm -hmm. So this is why when she's giving you the context of saying, oh, Nigerian, House of Fulani, who 1835 led the Mele uprising, because these African populations were in Brazil, mm -hmm. Afro-Brazilian. If you go to Rio, if you go to Sao Paulo, if you go to various places in Brazil, you'll see this influence. There's certainly the same experience within the Caribbean and Barbados, within Jamaica, within uh, uh, Grenada. You see the African Muslim influence there too as well. Even in my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, the, the plan of Denmark Basie was also to make his way to the Caribbean too as well because and, and there's various accounts it's not authenticated so I, I don't like giving you a uh, suggestion